Day, and welcome to a special post-singularity episode of InstaVision. Uh, I'm lying, actually. It's not post-singularity yet. Uh, maybe it is, and we just don't know it. Uh, well, my guest is James D. Miller. He'll talk about this. He's an economics professor at Smith College. He's the author of Singularity Rising, Surviving and Thriving in a Smarter... I like that. Richer, I like that. And more dangerous, maybe I don't like that so much, world. Uh, great. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Well, thanks for having me on your show, Glenn. So for the benefit of some of our reader, our viewers who, who don't follow this as closely, oh, what is the singularity? Sure. The singularity is a period in time in which we either have machines that are a lot smarter than people are today, or we've significantly increased human intelligence enough to radically remake civilization. Yeah, well, in your book you talk a lot about increasing machine intelligence and you have this sort of takeoff spiral uh, that you posit where we design machines that are smarter than us and then they're able to design machines that are smarter than them and, and so on uh, as one path. Uh, another path is where we just make ourselves smarter and smarter. Uh, why are we so sure that intelligence is so important? I mean, we're a lot more intelligent than an ant, uh, but what's relevant to the ant isn't that we're smarter than it so much as that we can step on it. <laughs> uh, well, that's true. Well, intelligence is really um, optimization power. It's the ability to solve problems. And so almost tautologically, as you get better at solving problems, you, you can you know, achieve more of your goals. So in some ways, if you have goals, the smarter you are, the better you'll be able to achieve them. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, intelligence is sort of the universal solvent in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's amazing how many, how many different things turn out to be better if you're smarter. Uh, and there's all kinds of research on that. You know, I, I, I know the troops in combat who are in the lower range of the IQ thing die a lot more than troops who are in the higher, even if everything else is the same, because it turns out it's just better to be smarter, even with people who are shooting at you. I, I just wonder if that, if that projects onward, though. I mean, one of the things that strikes me as interesting is... Um, in the natural world, uh, IQ is not that rewarded, or at least it seems like human IQ has been relatively stagnant. And if it were that much better to be twice as smart as we are, uh, that that would have evolved, unless it's just that it's too expensive. Yeah, I think it probably is too expensive. I mean, our brain already uses so much energy, and we have to get you know our heads through the birth canal that there are significant evolutionary constraints on intelligence. But these won't apply to machines, and they, they don't have to apply now in a world in which most people actually have too many calories rather than too few. Yeah, well, we have smart machines, uh, and they're getting smarter, uh, and that's probably good, but I, I do note in fiction, uh, the portrayal of smart machines is maybe not universally, but pretty overwhelmingly negative, uh, like in, well, this clip from the Terminator movies, for example. Hey, Dad, don't need to face a new nightmare. The war against the machines. And okay, maybe it's not quite as dramatic, but uh, also in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, where Hal's no Terminator, but. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Hey, although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you. I could see your lips move. So will uh, super smart machines inevitably be dangerous? Or is this just uh, that uh, fiction does better with a strong villain than with a, I don't know, a strong uh, artificial intelligence hero? Well, I think it's inevitable unless they're deliberately made to be friendly. I think the default path is that they treat us horribly. The reason is there's a limited amount of resources in the universe. And if machines have goals that don't include being friendly to people, they'll probably take all the resources that we need to survive. I mean, it, but it, the, the struggle between us and machines, I don't think it'll be the way it plays out in movies. It would be more like the United States military declares war on a tribe of chimpanzees. It would be over almost instantly. And that would make for a boring movie. So I think I'm, in a lot of these movies, people are stronger than they otherwise would be <laughs> for plot reasons. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, of course, maybe the robots will love us too much, and that has its own hazards, uh, as illustrated in this clip from Futurama. <laughs> Billy, do you want to walk your dog? No, thanks, Mom. I'd rather make out with my own robot. Actually, I think... And, of course, in this one, the human race dies out. <laughs> 
Well, actually, I think that sex bots pose a major danger to human civilization. I mean, so many men, you know, work and struggle in high school and college for the hopes of attracting women. Well, what happens if, you know, you, a robot could better fulfill a typical man's sexual desires than a woman ever could? A lot of people might just devote their lives to video games and sex bots and earn just enough to survive and our civilization won't make it. I think we're actually seeing a precursor of that right now with internet porn and video games. I think that's a that's a, a pretty low intensity version of sex bots. But even there, I think you you in fact are seeing, according to a lot of you know pop culture accounts, uh, that uh, young men are to a greater degree sort of dropping out of the dating market. Yeah, I know. I, I think you're right. In, in some ways, I mean, porn is like candy. It's it's hacking an evolutionary desire that we have, but it does it in a way that actually reduces our our, our fitness. And so this. You know, some people I think have proposed this might be an answer to Fermi's paradox of why haven't intelligence, intelligent aliens contacted us? Well, maybe you inevitably develop sex spots and you, you lose interest in everything other than that. <laughs> so they die out, but at least they die out happy. That's better than the Terminator. Uh, yeah. Well, what can we do to make things safer? You talk about sort of uh, basically uh, programming AI to be friendly. How do you do that? Well, I'm... The, the best way is to develop a mathematical understanding of friendliness. And there's actually people in an organization called the Singularity Institute that they're trying to do that. They're not currently writing computer code, but they're trying to reduce to equations what constitutes friendliness. And it's really difficult because you're going to have these computers get smarter and smarter. So you need a computer that starts friendly and stays friendly. And so their goal is to figure out how to create friendly software before we actually have these super smart AIs. In a sense, there's a race, and if we don't win, our species is probably doomed. Yeah, I guess the hardest part is, is making something that doesn't contain loopholes that could be exploited by somebody who's a whole lot smarter than you. Uh, yeah. And uh, it takes us a long way beyond Asimov's three laws, uh, certainly. Uh, and, you know, actually, I talked to a guy who was a, a screenwriter. He wrote for the uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles Terminator spinoff and I was telling him, you know, well, this is just an argument for why we need friendly AI. And his response uh, was, how do you know Skynet didn't start out as friendly AI? So, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that was apparently part of their story arc that didn't ever get used. Uh, how do you do that? Well, first, I mean, it might not be possible. Nature doesn't always pose fair challenges to species. I, we hope there's some people who are extraordinarily good at math who are working at the Singularity Institute and they're trying to attract the best and the brightest of the world and hopefully they can figure it out. But again, it, this really will come down to math. Can we write a computer program where we're mathematically certain that it will be friendly and stay friendly towards us? Now, the advantage is once you have something that's friendly and smart, if it were to improve itself, it would have a desire to stay friendly. So just as you would never take a pill that would cause you to hate your children, a computer that was genuinely friendly would never allow itself to be modified in a way that became unfriendly. So we essentially got to get it started, and then we can count on its own super intelligence to maintain its friendliness. But whether it's possible to get it started, that's not certain. I mean, it, it might just be that our species is doomed. Well, that's a cheerful note. Uh, well, perhaps we <laughs> can program in love I suppose the other possibility is we don't have to worry about super intelligent AIs killing us off because we could follow a path where we basically become super intelligent AIs ourselves. Yeah, that is another path a lot of people talk about where we merge with machines, where we keep putting you know, computer implants into our brains and uh, we become smarter and smarter. Um, I think this is almost certainly something that will happen if we don't first create the super intelligent AIs. Now, of course, the problem with this path is we don't know when we start messing with the human brain, what will that do with our value systems, or will it empower people who aren't, you know, very, very nice. But it, it does seem likely, though, that going sort of the pure machine intelligence route, that does have a much higher potential, because our, our brain is software that runs on meat, and it runs on meat that's not very fast at transmitting information compared to what we can already do with computers. But I think the most hopeful approach is to sort of increase human intelligence as fast as we can so we become smart enough to figure out how to create super smart AIs. Well, I th what about the approach of just banning all this stuff? Uh, I don't think that's possible. I mean, there's, it could be that 25 people in a basement are enough to create a super intelligent AI. Plus, there's a lot of other things that can wipe out our species besides unfriendly artificial intelligence. 
The great thing about AI is if we get that right, that takes care of all our other problems. So we don't have to worry about global warming or plagues or asteroids blowing, you know, destroying us if we can create super intelligent computers. So I think our best path is to focus on trying to get really, really good and friendly AI. And that will, that will probably cause us to be able to survive till the end of the universe. Well, I suppose the advantages for a military or for that matter, a hedge fund in having a super intelligent AI or even a somewhat smarter than the smartest people AI uh, are so great that it would be hard to get any sort of a ban to really hold water. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. I mean, there's such tremendous military and economic benefits to intelligence that you're going to have so many entities that will keep trying to create things that are smarter and smarter, and eventually someone will accidentally or int intentionally cross the threshold into a, you know, a, a self-aware machine that then further increases its own intelligence. I mean, we're, I think even if we were virtually certain that unfriendly, that AI would destroy us, we'd still probably develop it. We're, we're kind of destined to walk along that path. So our best chance of survival is to, you know, devote a lot of resources to creating friendly AI and to have the mathematical framework ready for when someone does create a self-aware machine intelligence. Yeah, so I know you're not yourself a super intelligent AI. <laughs> uh, well, I don't actually know that. Uh, you could be faking this whole thing up. You could be the front end of a super intelligent AI designed to seduce us all. Uh, but uh, uh, ruling that hypothesis out is somewhat unlikely. <laughs> Uh, give me your gut, rather than your super intelligent AI forecast, uh, how good do you think humanity's chances are of making it, say, through the next thousand years? Well, I mean, firstly, I think if we make it through the next 80 or so, we'll definitely make it the rest of the way, unless we choose to kill ourselves. I don't know, maybe one in four or so of survival. What really scares me is the fact that we haven't seen an evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, there's so many planets out there that probably can support life, why hasn't anyone else made it here? There's probably something with what's being called a great filter that prevents civilizations from giving birth to star-faring civilizations. And we seem so close to being able to send out, you know, um, self-replicating probes into the, the galaxy that it just, I, I think it's very likely there's something that's going to destroy us fairly soon. If I'm going to go, I want it to be at the hands of the Monroe bots and not Skynet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, so where can people go to find out more? Um, well, the Singularity Institute has a website that's probably the, the best resource. And then um, they could do a lot of reading. There's my book, um, Ray Kurzweil's book, Singular The Singularity is Near, is the, probably the best source uh, for that. Um, there's also a website. Optimistic less, than you. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's much more optimistic. There's an online community called lesswrong.com. They're devoted to promoting the art of rationality, but it's, it's run by the Singularity Institute people. And their goal in part is to train people in the future to create, to have the rational skills to create friendly AI. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this. And I hope we survive the Skynets, the Monrobots, and the various other uh, threats that uh, we probably can't even imagine. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. And that was James Miller. He is an economics professor at Smith College, and he's the author of Singularity Rising, Surviving and Thriving in a Smarter, Richer, and More Dangerous World. Uh, I hope we'll be here at least next week. Uh, in the meantime, have fun on the Internet. Thanks.